Selamat siang rekan-rekan semuanya. Selamat datang di Data Ok by Data On. Apa kabar semuanya? Semoga sehat-sehat. Salam kenal ya semuanya. Perkenalkan nama saya Celadinya yang akan membantu sesi webinar pada hari ini. Sebelumnya saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada teman-teman rekan-rekan yang sudah berpartisipasi pada webinar Data Talk dan Humanica yang akan mengangkat topik How to Optimize Towards a Cost Efficiency HR. HR. Selama kurang lebih dua jam, nanti kita akan membahas tuntas mengenai defining cost efficiency, measure and analyze, standards operation, and continuous improvement. Nah, materi ini akan dibawakan oleh Mr. Aksyat Josi, selaku CEO Humanica Consulting Services yang telah hadir pada webinar hari ini. Dan akan dibantu juga oleh Pak Yance Ongkosari, selaku Implementation Director Data On. Setelah sesi dari pembicara selesai, akan dilanjutkan oleh sesi Q&A nih rekan-rekan. Jika rekan-rekan ingin bertanya, bisa langsung menuliskan pertanyaan pada kolom Q&A yang tertera. Nanti kami akan bantu tanyakan kepada speakers. Jika pertanyaannya menggunakan bahasa Indonesia, akan kami bantu translate kepada speakers. Jika uh, pertanyaannya uh, belum mau langsung bahasa Inggris, juga bisa langsung dituliskan saja. Jangan lupa menyertakan nama dan perusahaan. Nanti kami juga akan share QR feedback form yang akan diisi oleh rekan-rekan karena sekaligus untuk mendapatkan e-certificate. Pada sesi terakhir akan ada kaut kuis nih dengan total 1 juta rupiah untuk 5 orang pemenang dengan rules gunakan nama sesuai registrasi agar mudah untuk dicek oleh tim data on. Pemenang satu mendapatkan 350 ribu rupiah, 300 ribu, 200 ribu, 100 ribu, dan 50 ribu. Syar pemenangnya nih, rekan-rekan harus mengisi feedback form. Jika tidak mengisi, akan digugurkan dan akan dipilih pemenang urutan selanjutnya. Untuk pengiriman hadiah pemenang, akan dihubungi oleh tim data on setelah webinar selesai ya. Sebelum masuk ke materi, mungkin ada sebagian rekan-rekan di sini yang belum familiar dengan Humanica dan data on. Dan apa sih solusi bisnis yang mereka tawarkan? Kalau begitu, saya akan berikan sedikit informasi mengenai Humanica dan Data On. PT Indodev Niaga Internet alias Data On adalah penyedia solusi bisnis terkemuka untuk bidang HR, ERP, dan accounting yang dikenal dengan nama Sunfish. Nah, lokasi kantor kami berada di Nisi Bintaro Kampus, Bintaro, Tangerang Selatan. Data On telah berdiri sejak tahun 1999 dan pada tahun 2002, 22, maaf, Data On resmi bergabung bersama Humanica yang merupakan penyedia solusi HR terbesar di Asia Tenggara. Dengan bergabungnya Data On bersama Humanica, kini kami menjadi provider solusi HR terkemuka di Asia Tenggara. Dan kini kantor kami tersebar di enam negara loh, yaitu ada di Thailand, Indonesia, Singapura, Malaysia, Filipina, dan Vietnam. Data On dan Humanica juga telah dipercaya sekitar 5.000 perusahaan loh dengan 2 juta pengguna aktif dari berbagai segmen industri seperti manufacture, mining, kesehatan, dan lainnya. Melalui merger ini juga, Data On dan Humanica meluncurkan platform Human Capital Management terbaru yaitu Sunfish Workplace. Lalu Humanica meluncurkan service baru nih dan menjadi One Stop HR Solution. Sehingga kini tidak hanya sebagai solusi software, HR, dan payroll outsourcing, tapi kini memiliki consulting service juga. Humanica Consulting Service memiliki tiga service utama. Yang pertama, ada HR Transformation Advisory. Yang kedua, ada HCM System Implementation Consulting Scoop dan Workforce Intelligence and Coaching. Untuk lebih detailnya, nanti akan dijelaskan oleh Mr. Aksyat Yosi pada webinar hari ini. Mungkin uh, perkenan cukup, kita langsung mulai ke webinar hari ini. Sebelumnya saya akan menyapa para speakers, Mr. Aksyat dan uh, Pak Yance. Hai Mr. Aksyat, hai Pak Yance, how are you? Selamat siang, selamat siang Sheila. Selamat, selamat siang Bapak-Ibu sekalian, praktisi HR. Hai Mr. Aksyat, how are you? Hi, sorry, I was talking on mute. Uh, I'm good. Uh, I hope you all are great as well. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Akshat and Pak Yanchu for your time to, to join today's webinar. Okay, maybe the first pre presentation will be by Akshat and will continue by Pak Yanchu. Okay, Mr. Akshat, maybe you can start your presentation. Sure. 
Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen. Give me a second here. Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, thank you everyone for making time. I think uh, this is a very interesting topic um, in this day and age. I think uh, given the economic climate, uh, you know, most organizations today um, in Asia and globally are thinking about thinking very carefully about how they are allocating their costs um, and what returns are they getting on it. Um, so the HR department should also think about this, obviously. Um, and so that's why we thought at Humanica Data On, we thought this is a very interesting topic to cover on how do you, how do you optimize your HR function uh, to be more cost efficient, right? So that's that's the topic today. I'm going to go through a couple of slides. Pakanchi is going to come in. He's got a couple of examples to talk about as well. Uh, so we, we'll just uh, go through it as we um, get along. Um, first thing we want to understand today is uh, the definition of cost efficiency to begin with, right? So what exactly is cost efficiency? What do we mean by it? How is it different from cost reduction? Um, and then there are three levers or three methods, uh, in my opinion, to become more cost efficient as an HR function, right? The first one is around measuring and analyzing your HR function. Um, the second one, we'll talk more in details. The second one is around standardizing your operations. This means processes, this means policies and those kind of things. And the third one is to sort of continuously improve your HR function <clears throat> because cost efficiency is not something we can achieve by doing it just once and forgetting about it. So we'll talk about how do you um, embed a culture of continuous improvement within your HR. And finally, of course, uh, we'll, we'll take any questions. If you have questions throughout this session, please feel free to put them in the chat window. Uh, in English or Bahasa, my team will help me out. Uh, they might even answer your questions straight away if they can. Otherwise, we'll pick it up in the end, right? I think in the end, we also have a quiz and some exciting prizes to give away. So let's just get started, right? Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing is about um, you know defining cost efficiency itself, uh, and I think that, that definition is important as we uh, go along and discuss the rest of the topics. Right, cost efficiency is essentially about achieving a balance. It's uh, not about uh, purely costs um, or productivity or those kind of things. Uh, let's uh, let's just understand this a little bit. Um, so. Cost efficiency, the way I define it, I like to define it, it's a ratio of benefits over costs, right? So what are the benefits you're getting uh, given the costs that you have invested in your HR function? So what are the benefits, if you look at the <clears throat> numerator there, what are the benefits we can talk about in the HR function? We can talk about increased employee engagement, higher productivity levels, is your workforce upskilling themselves? You know, other things like uh, how how well are you able to attract the right kind of talent? Are you able to retain them well? What's your time to fill? These are the benefits of running a good HR function. And then, of course, there's the cost, right, of running the HR function itself. Uh, there's the headcount related costs. So every HR team has members that, you know, the compensation and benefits, the fully loaded labor cost, as we call it as well as the operational costs of running any function similar to uh, you know just just uh, as, just like any other function hr also has its own operational costs uh, we can talk about general administration costs here we can talk about software costs uh, you could talk about vendor costs maybe your benefits or payroll is outsourced you know those those are vendor costs and you need to incur these costs because you need to run the function so these are necessary costs but ultimately Cost efficiency is a ratio between those benefits um, and the costs that are being put in, right? So it's not just about cost reduction. Um, when we look at any HR function, firstly, if you look at the visual on the on the left, the, the pyramid there, <clears throat> um, you think about all the things that HR does. You can sort of classify that into three types of activities. Uh, one is the strategy uh, type of activities. Uh, you are creating your HR master plan. You are creating your uh, workforce planning strategy. How many people will we need in three, five years? Maybe you are thinking about your talent management strategy or talent acquisition strategy. So all those strategy jobs, right? Then there are what we call the middle office jobs or the operational jobs. Uh, perhaps you are running uh, one business unit uh, within your organization. You're supporting one business unit or you're supporting the operations of a given geography, right? A given country. Um, and you need to take those strategies and you need to operationalize them. You need to make them real, right? So that's the operational work. And then finally, you have the administration work, 
right? Uh, which is uh, something necessary. Uh, we have to do it. Uh, all the paperwork, payroll processing, uh, benefits administration, learning administration, uh, you know, uh, recruitment administration, contracting. Uh, there are filings with the government, uh, regulatory paperwork that we need to do. So all those administrative tasks that are important uh, and have to be done, right? Now, if you think about it, in most organizations, in most HR organizations, a lot of the headcount, a lot of the people that we have in our HR team are busy with the administrative part of HR, right? Because it takes a lot of time to get these jobs done, right? So you can see headcount per transaction, maximum amount is spent on administration. A little less on operations. And then finally, whatever time's left is what we spend on strategy. I mean, it's not the case in every organization, but most organizations have this problem wherein a lot of the headcount that we have in HR is spending its time largely on administration and operations and the least amount of time actually on strategy because you know administration and operations basically take away a lot of your time anyway. Um, so that's point number one, right? So, but if, if you think about it, <clears throat> the cost that we're spending on HR Actually, per transaction, and by transaction, we mean any given transaction in HR. Let's say we are recruiting one person. Let's call that one transaction. We are processing one pay slip. Let's call that one transaction. The cost that we spend should by right per transaction should be highest on strategy, followed by operations and then administration. You don't want to spend too much on administration. So you can see the problem there, right? If we are spending most of our time on administration, naturally, our, most of our costs are also being spent on administration. And what you want actually is quite the opposite of that. You want to spend maximum amount of your costs uh, or you want to allocate maximum costs on strategy and the minimum on administration. Now, this is not, it's, we don't live in a perfect universe. It doesn't exactly work out like that all the time. But generally speaking, that should be the direction we take when we think about where are we spending our HR costs and how do we optimize that, right? So that's the first point. Um, cost efficiency is a ratio. And then what we want to do is spend the most on strategy and spend the least on administration. How do we do that? We will talk about it as we go along uh, those three levers and, and, and those kind of things. Yeah. The other thing worth noting is what cost efficiency is not. Um, and this is a, a common mistake many organizations make actually uh, when they start becoming or try to become more cost efficient uh, they overthink about one aspect of cost efficiency and ignore the others, right? So there are three aspects that are important. You can see on the right here, the costs, right? Um, the, which is, of course, with what we just discussed. The quality of your HR function, the quality of your HR services is just as important as the costs involved. And finally, the productivity, right? So how many people uh, or FTEs are we incurring, because FTEs are ultimately cost, how much FTE are we incurring on processing a given transaction? How many people do we need to get one job done, right? And can we make it faster, quicker? So cost, quality, productivity, that's that's sort of the, the three aspects of cost efficiency. And what happens is if we think about one aspect and forget about the others, we can make a mistake in becoming cost efficient, right? We may reduce costs, uh, but we will suffer maybe on the quality side of things or maybe the productivity side of things. In fact, there's an example given here. This is uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> one of the very famous retailers, uh, fashion brand, um, and they were trying to increase their um, uh, you know productivity. Um, and in order to do that, and they wanted to reduce some costs by increasing productivity, the problem they were facing was about rostering or scheduling. Some of us maybe in companies where we have to schedule people, right? Shift workers and those kind of things. Um, and they try to automate that, that, that thing using um, a software. Uh, but the fundamental problem that was made uh, in this particular case um, was that the entire focus was on productivity and automation through software, um, but the constraints uh, that, that uh, occur uh, or the constraints that exist rather um, in that retail setup were never factored in, right? So the, basically they never spoke with the employees and managers to really understand what kind of constraints we have. Um, and the software started kind of uh, rostering people randomly on various shifts. 
uh, which led to work life balance issues, uh, burnout issues, uh, and then you know they they see, they saw their attrition levels go quite up. Obviously, when a lot of your good employees leave, your quality to the customer suffers. So their clients were not happy, or their customers were not happy, and ultimately, you know, eventually, of course, they they ended up fixing all of that. But you can see how overthinking, over indexing about one thing and not thinking about the other things can lead to a disaster, right? In this particular case, the entire focus was on productivity and maybe costs, uh, but in the end, quality suffered because of that, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to think about all these three things as we talk about cost efficiency. Now, like I said earlier, <clears throat> there are three levers for cost efficiency that we want to talk about today. Um, there is something around measurement and analysis. Uh, here we will talk about benchmarking uh, and we'll talk about how benchmarking le can lead to sort of better decision making and identifying the root cause of issues. I'll give you a, a real life example around that as well. Uh, we'll talk about standardization. This is largely around processes and policies. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we need to, why we need to, again, all three things are important, right? Cost, productivity, and quality. So we, we'll talk about personas. We'll talk about why that's important, why it's important to understand the, the user experience or your employee experience when you start digitizing things or standardizing things. Um, and finally, we'll talk about continuous improvement, right? So we have some good ideas there. Actually, Humanica Consulting here, uh, we are launching uh, one of the very innovative services uh, that will help you with continuous improvement uh, but you know you you can of course take away ideas from this um, and and if you, if you want to you could you could do it on your own uh, but we have something very interesting to to share with you there as well and along the way we we have some examples on standardization um, as well as continuous improvement so those are the three levers we'll talk about <clears throat> that's the uh, main uh, agenda of the day there are two things though that I'm not covering today which are also very very important for being cost efficient. Um, and that's primarily because uh, you're all very familiar with Humanica data on. So I'm, I'm guessing that you may already have addressed these things. But if you haven't, I would I would uh, ask you to consider them, those two things as well. And th that they will be technology um, and outsourcing, right? So uh, as you can understand, if you want to be efficient, you want productivity, uh, you are better off having a good digital system to begin with, right? So Products like Sunfish, uh, Humatrix, uh, you know, uh, Workplace are perfect candidates for these kind of things. So it's almost a given these days. You you sort of need these kind of systems to just because they 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 serve as the backbone of your HR function. So that's one. We're not talking too much about it. I think we have some samples to show you later. Uh, but that's one more thing that we don't have on the on the slide right now. And the other thing would be outsourcing. It's something that should be considered. If you remember, I spoke about how most HR functions actually uh, spend most, you know, a lot of their time on administration and, and things like payroll benefits, these kind of things are pure administration actually. Um, and a lot of that can be outsourced. And by doing so, obviously you can reduce the amount of headcount that or cost uh, that you spend um, on those administrative jobs and you can spend more time or more costs on strategy, right? So that's the other thing, but we're not going into details of that today. Uh, if you're familiar with Humanica, uh, you would know about this. If not, you can read more about it. But the three things that we talk about today are these, yeah? That is assuming that some basics are in place. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the first method, the first lever, which is around measurements and analysis. Um, and like I say here, you, you can't fix what you don't understand, right? So many a times when um, uh, HR uh, leaders, HR function, or even business leaders, they want to be more efficient in the business operations. They want their operational expenses to come down, um, or they want to uh, make sure that the organization is the right size. We don't have too many or too few people. Um, the, the, the starting point should be basically measurement, right? And by measurement, I mean benchmarking. Um, so you need to kind of look at how much, how much, how much FTE do you have right now? What sort of, uh, you know, again, cost, quality, productivity. So there are three kinds of uh, benchmarking matrices. You've got some formulas here today as examples, uh, but essentially you want to look at the costs of your HR function, um, and you want to compare that against an organization that is of similar size, scale, scope, uh, sector. 
um, and, and these benchmarking databases are available. Uh, Humanica Consulting can provide them if you want that. But the first step is to measure internally. You need to look at where you are anyway. So you can see, uh, as an example, we, we, we can uh, we, we are giving you here, uh, cost of HR service delivery, right? So what is the cost of delivering HR services in your organization? What you do is you take the overall fully loaded labor costs. So you look at the compensation and benefits plus the SGNA that you have. So fully loaded labor cost of your strategy HR. Same thing for your operational HR. So you can just also put your HR FTEs. I'm sure we're HR people, so we would be familiar with the full-time equivalent FTE concept. Um, so you, you take the FTEs that are uh, spending their time on strategic HR work versus operational HR work. Some might have split role. They do a little bit of strategy, a little bit of operation, and a little bit of administration. That's fine. Uh, you take the F FTEs on the administrative, and then you multiply that, of course, by the cost and, 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 and headcount, and that kind of gives you uh, the cost of your HR service, services delivery, right? So it's pretty straightforward as such. Uh, same deal for time allocation, like where are we spending our time? So for example, if you want to sort of figure out what is the average time that we're spending um, on uh, COE related matters, right? So you take the time spent on COE, FTEs uh, spent on COE matters and divide that by the total time of your um, HR, right? So generally speaking, there are four kinds of rules in HR. Um, there is the center of excellence or essentially the strategy uh, units within your HR. Uh, there is the shared services. You may or may not call it a shared service, but essentially we're talking we're talking about the administration team here, right? So if you don't have a centralized shared service, you may have an administration team. So consider that your SHRSS or shared service. Um, business partnering is the th the, the third kind of HR role that you have. Uh, I think we all understand what business partnering is. Uh, this is working with business leaders to solve the business issues. Um, and then you may have some on-site HR generalists, as we also call it. Um, especially in organizations that are a little spread out, they usually have some on-site HR people as well, right? So those four roles. So in terms of time allocation, again, pretty straightforward. You can replace the COE with shared service or business partner. That gives you the percentage time allocation of that role. Why are we doing these two things? Obviously, because one, we want to understand what is the cost of our HR function per FTE per in, in the organization. Second, we also want to see Cost is one thing, but where are we spending our time, right? So what percentage of our time is spent on COE matters versus administration versus business partnering and so on and so forth. And when you look at that, it should give you some pretty good insights on whether or not there is room for improvement and if so, how, right? <clears throat> now, when you conduct a benchmarking exercise, if you, if you go ahead and compare yourselves to another organization, uh, there's uh, there's a couple of things to remember uh, before we go about it, right? So the first one is we have to have the willingness to accept the results, good or bad, right? Uh, this is, think of this like a diagnostic, right? And whatever the results are, that's that's fine. If it's good, it's good. If it's not, we'll make it good. We'll, we'll figure out what to do. Uh, the second thing that's important is we need to compare apples to apples, right? No two organizations can be a perfect match of each other, but you try your best to compare yourselves to an organization that is as similar to your organization in terms of its context and strategy and those kind of things. Um, the other one is uh, you may need to do some adjustments, right? <clears throat> because again, your organization may have some unique requirements, considerations, and so you may need to adjust the benchmarks. And that's a, that's an art uh, and, and a science at the same time. I'll give you in, in, the, in this example, you will see what, what I'm talking about. Um, it's always good to sort of start with some kind of a hypothesis. So perhaps you might have a gut feel that maybe we are spending too much time on administration. Maybe it is because we haven't standardized, let's say, our recruitment process, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. You may have a gut feel already on what the problem might be. So start with that hypothesis. And then when you look at the actual data, you can test it and see if that hypothesis is correct or not. Uh, so it helps you dive deeper on specific areas. Um, and then finally, you know, numbers are one thing because benchmarking is all about numbers, uh, but the context is important, right? Um, and so as you as you look at the numbers, also look at the context, why, and that, that will tell you why the numbers look the way they do, right? <clears throat> now, finally, uh, benchmarking is fine, but the real value lies in identifying the interventions, the so what, right? 
Um, so looking at the numbers, comparing, okay, this one's big, this one's small, okay, fine, but what are we going to do about it? And those interventions should help us close the gaps. That's the most important thing in any benchmarking exercise. So here I have uh, an example and I'll just walk through this, <clears throat> this case study. Uh, this is one of the companies that uh, called us and said, listen, uh, it seems like we're always busy. That was their hypothesis, right? It seems like our HR team, we have a lot of people here in our HR function. It's not like we have a small team, uh, but still no matter what we do, we always seem to be busy. Uh, we do have some technology. We have outsourced some of our payroll. Uh, you know, so all the, some of the basics are in place, but I don't know why it seems like we have too much work all the time. And that was the, the problem that this, uh, this company was facing. And, uh, you know, the HR leader used to approach the business uh, leaders all the time for additional headcount, uh, budgets for hiring more people in HR. And the business leaders used to say, listen, you already have so many people. It's very difficult for us to allow you to hire more people in your team. So they wanted us to come in and really investigate on in what's going on. And so that's what we did, right? Now, um, the starting point obviously for us was to sit down and formulate a few uh, hypotheses based on interviews um, and focus groups and those kind of things. So essentially we met uh, some, of, uh, some of the HR team members, we met some of the employees and managers, we met some of the people in the IT department, you know, the ones providing the HR technology at that time. Um, and we also met some of the business leaders to really just identify a few hypotheses, right? So you can see the issues here on the on the left and some probable reasons. At this stage, we did not know what the actual reason was, right? So some of the issues that came up <clears throat> in our conversation, <clears throat> the first one was around uh, role clarity or lack of role clarity, right? So like I said earlier, there are four main roles in HR, right? Uh, you could be a business partner, a COE person, like a strategy person, uh, you could be administration or on-site generalists. Um, in this particular organization, while they had a big HR team, everyone in HR was doing everything at this, uh, you know, all the time, right? So there was no real role demarcation on who takes care of administration versus strategy versus, uh, you know, or gen generalist HR uh, matters. Everyone just sort of all hands on deck all the time. And, and there was that. So we identified a few probable reasons. Again, this is based on our uh, interviews. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see there was a, you know, one probable reason could be, of course, lack of role clarity. It was never defined in that manner. Uh, it could also be that maybe they have a, a real uh, resourcing issue. Uh, so maybe the workload is so high that even if people do have these so-called roles on paper, everyone just ends up doing everything uh, when when the rubber hits the road, right? So there could be uh, that. Maybe it was that you know. So the the lack of budgets uh, for hiring additional help when they needed was creating the situation as well. So those were the uh, probable reasons we sort of started with. Another issue that we identified uh, we don't have uh, so was uh, you know employees were expecting HR to support on non HR matters. Now this was an an, an interesting finding for us. Uh, we found out as we dug deeper that uh, HR in this organization uh, was, and this is a fairly big uh, multinational uh, pharmaceutical company, mind you. Um, HR here was handling other issues such as other matters such as uh, fleet management. So they had, uh, you know, cars that used to pick up their employees, cars and vans, and HR was managing the fleet as well. Uh, they also used to take care of other matters such as, so they had uh, this culture of celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, those kind of things. And HR was responsible for that. And again, being a big organization, it's someone's birthday every day. So there was a lot of, uh, there were events that were organized that were also not necessarily HR events. I mean, general business events, uh, uh, team building events, for example, and HR was doing that as well. Now, there's nothing wrong in this. I mean, you might say, hey, we also do that. Um, <clears throat> but we have to remember that when we are comparing ourselves and when we're benchmarking ourselves to another organization, they may or may not be doing all of this, right? And these jobs by right are not, strictly speaking, are not HR jobs, right? Uh, these, are, these are important jobs. Someone has to do it. And if HR department has to do it, fine. Uh, but we just have to be mindful. In this particular organization, employees expected HR to do all of that, right? 
So very well taken care of uh, employee group. Um, another uh, uh, issue we identified, we're not going to go through the whole list. There was a much bigger list. I'll just take these three. The third one was managers. Ex the managers uh, in this organization, I'm talking about middle management, people managers with direct reports. Um, they needed very high touch support on people matters. What do I mean by high touch? Uh, if you are a people manager, it should be expected that you will take care of things like uh, you know, uh, performance management, uh, talking to your employees, making sure they are engaged, uh, some of the team building matters, right? Um, so all these things are, you know, people management matters. And here in this organization, people managers didn't really manage their people and they just wanted HR to manage for them, right? So if, if they are releasing the performance uh, results at the end of the year, HR has to do it. Uh, if uh, compensation is being uh, you know, released uh, for the next year increments, HR has to communicate that. And if employees are not happy, they will just blame the HR, right? So this, again, takes up a lot of time from HR. Um, and, you know, while you, you could say, hey, but, you know, in our organizations, managers will not be able to do all this. HR has to do it. Okay, fine, if that's the case. But you have to be mindful uh, that this takes HR time and therefore costs. So we have to be mindful when we do benchmarking. Anyway, we then sort of did an analysis. We went into the numbers, being mindful of what we had identified. And what we found out was that, firstly, HR team on the whole, 82% of them were working more than eight hours in a given day. Again, many organizations have that situation. Not every organization you can have a strict eight-hour work window because you know the nature of work is such uh, so there is that, but it tells us something. If 82% of our HR colleagues are working more than eight hours every single day, it tells us the workflow, workload is maybe a little bit higher than what it should be, right? So that's one. The second thing we found out was the exact opposite of that in a way. Um, so we found that 18% of all the jobs that HR was doing was non-HR work right? Fleet management, birthday parties, uh, team building events, all those things, but not, co co what, not what I would call core HR activities, which is from recruitment to exit and everything in between, right? So they only used to spend 80% of their time on core HR activities. And you have to be mindful that almost 80% of them are working over time or more than eight hours, I should say, in a given day all the time. So clearly there's a lot of workload and there's also work that is not HR. So that's that's what this uh, data point told us. So it sort of started to become clear on why we are always too busy, right? Um, HR was working overtime and spending a significant amount of time on non-HR administrative matters. And therefore, when we did the benchmarking exercise, now I can't go through the entire benchmarking exercise on, a, on an uh, event like this, of course, because a lot more details under this. But... As you can imagine, when we started to, this is the adjustment part, like I said earlier, you have to be mindful of what your organization's context is and then compare, make the right comparisons, making the right adjustments, then, then the situation becomes clear, right? So what we did was we took out uh, the overtime hours or more than eight hours. We also took out the non-core co um, activity time and we looked at just the time that was spent on core HR activities in the standard working hours because FTE is based on a, usually based on an eight hour workday, right? So again, you need to make the right comparison. Now, any benchmarking um, exercise, most in fact, benchmarks out there, not every benchmark, typically will have a, some kind of a range, right? So again, I'm not gonna go into too much details today, but what we found was that if we did not adjust for this additional work that the uh, team is doing, um, and we did not adjust for the fact that they were spending a lot more time than eight hours a day, almost every one of them. If we did not adjust for it, it did appear that this team was a little bloated, oversized, those kind of things, right? Because when you compare it to others, it did the unadjusted ratio looked bad. But when you do adjust for all of that, they were actually quite close to the median, right? So if the low and the high and the medium, median in the middle. So you can see the, uh, the, the ratio then was uh, better. The other thing that we did was we did a projection on what happens if the business continues to grow, i.e. our headcount. This organization was, was growing and they were hiring more people, more employees, which is great. 
but you also have to support all these uh, employees. So the amount of HR transactions that you have will obviously go up. Um, and what we found was that if we do not do anything right now, we don't do and make any interventions, we don't change anything about how HR is being run today, we will potentially go outside the range, which is not a good thing. You don't want your HR team to be too slim. You don't want it to be too fat. You want it to be optimal. Um, and that's the right way to do it. Uh, both those cases will result in uh, 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 you know, the, the quality of your HR services going down or your cost might go up significantly, right? So then of course, it was important for us to identify what are the interventions. So what do we do now that we have understood why we seem to be busy all the time, right? Um, so the first thing was, of course, we had to explain all of this to the business leaders. So in this particular case, benchmarking really did help the HR function get that headcount, uh, uh, extra budget for headcount, because once you explain this to the leaders and you show it, prove it through numbers and facts, uh, you know, then the business leaders immediately, they understood and they were like, okay, now we understand. Um, and of course, uh, at that point in time, it was difficult for all this general administration stuff to be taken away from HR because someone had to do it. Uh, but a couple of things were agreed, right? In the short run, in the short term, you can see the, you know, the recommendations we gave there, the gave at this organization. <clears throat> the, uh, of course, uh, additional budgets were provided to HR to hire uh, more people because we can see everyone's uh, quite busy. Uh, we also uh, went ahead and renegotiated the SLAs uh, with their vendors. So like I said, they already had some outsourcing, um, but we renegotiated the service level agreement. So the workload on HR came down a little bit. Um, we also uh, decided that eventually HR and general administration departments will be split. Uh, initially, it couldn't be done, but over a couple of months, I think it was done. And then uh, it was also decided that the HR technology needs to be upgraded uh, because almost 70% of your administration jobs can be done through self-service, right? So if you have a good modern solution like Workplace, you probably already have all that stuff. So you would know what I mean. Uh, but that was another longer term because it takes time to implement a technology like this, right? So those were the uh, few interventions in this particular case um, on, on how benchmarking helped. Um, and that's the first lever in terms of how to become cost efficient. You start by measurement and, and then move. Okay, um, the second lever is around uh, standardization. And this is largely around processes and policies, right? So let's, uh, this one may be familiar to uh, many of us, uh, but I just wanted to sort of focus on a few things uh, when it comes to standardization. <clears throat> and the first thing I wanted to sort of uh, clarify <clears throat> is the difference between standardization and harmonization. Now, many a times we use these words interchangeably and that's okay. Uh, in common speak, it's okay. <clears throat> but we have to understand that not everything can be standardized but almost everything can be harmonized, right? Uh, that's the best way to remember this. Uh, so when we say standardization, we're talking about consistent, consistent use of formats, uh, approach, uh, tone, voice. It could be a numbering scheme. It could be a process. It could be the policy that you have. Um, and it's, it's basically a common standard, as the word implies, uh, across your organization, while harmonization is the process of, you can standardize things, uh, certain things, and then you want those things to flow in harmony and that's harmonization. So it's having consistent processes and policies that work together across the HR service delivery model, right? Uh, so from your strategy to operations to administration, everything works together, nothing is broken and that's harmonization. Okay. Now, in many organizations, uh, this standardization um, and harmonization uh, kind of things are uh, taken care of when they are upgrading their HR infrastructure. So perhaps you are implementing a new technology uh, or, or maybe you went through a merger and acquisition recently. Maybe you acquired another company and now you want to harmonize the process. That could be another scenario. In fact, I think uh, Park Yanche has a as, a, as an example for us later on that. But the other thing worth uh, mentioning here is the difference between, uh, so the, the prerequisites that are required for you to standardize, right? Now, if you are trying to standardize your operations, um, it is extremely important that you take into account 
the data and the systems that you have uh, in your organization at that point, right? So if you do not have a foundational technology, uh, any like workplace or sunfish, if you don't have a basic technology in place, it's going to be very difficult to harmonize or standardize your operations, right? Because everything would be paper-based and then things just tend to kind of fragment uh, when you let them run manually or on paper. So that's, that's one. And then the data, right? So data, why data is important? Because when you standardize a given process, it requires certain data points, right? So when you're hiring an individual, you need certain data points, right? In order to create a, a, an employment contract, uh, for example, right? Um, so therefore you need to be very, very sure that your data is clean and in the right place and those kind of things, right? So data and systems are important. Prerequisites, I would say, you can't standardize a process and policy without thinking about data and systems. And then there's a slight difference between policy and process. Hopefully, most of us know this already, but in many uh, companies have seen uh, that the two words are used interchangeably. Process is how a function works and policy is the formal guidance around it, right? So policy is the what and the why we do things and process is who does it, when do they do it, how do they do it, right? And why do I make that distinction? Because standardizing processes is, <clears throat> in most cases, can be done and, and, and has a lot of value. Standardizing policies across your organization, let's say your organization is present in multiple countries or has multiple business units with different policies. Standardizing policies is not always uh, going to give you the highest ROI return on your investment. It's, it's firstly, it's very complicated to standardize a policy. And then not every policy, uh, you know, uh, gives you the return when you standardize it. I'll give you uh, a few examples here. So how do you go about policy standardization? Let's talk about that quickly and then jump to processes. Um, there's a certain criteria that I recommend. Uh, so here you can see, for example, uh, the, the prioritization criteria in this visual. Uh, strategic alignment, financial considerations, compliance, the value it will actually give you, uh, the impact on the organization or your employees, how easy it is to standardize a given policy, as well as, you know, how close are we to a leading practice, right? So <clears throat> those could be some criteria on the basis of which you can pick that, okay, this is the policy that we will standardize, right? Because we see that it will give us value, it will have a positive impact, we'll be close to leading practice, um, and and we'll, maybe we'll end up saving some costs when we standardize this policy. So that's how you go about picking a policy for standardization, right? Um, and usually uh, some policies are more popular, let's just say popular candidates for standardization. You can see them highlighted in blue here. Uh, when it comes to recruiting, for example, uh, your headcount related policies, like how many people will be hired and in what, under what circumstances, what will be the ratio you may have, long range plans, LRPs as they're called, or dollar to employee ratio. So, you know, policies around that. Uh, posting of people internally or externally. Uh, you can see onboarding there, org design. How do you go about your position management? That's an important one uh, because if you, if you don't manage your positions consistently across the organization, again, your data will be a little all over the place later on. Performance management, uh, it's at least the, the, the bonus declaration and, and those kind of things are also policies that are typically standardized. But again, there's no hard and fast rule to this, which policy to pick for standardization. It really just depends on your organization's context um, and what kind of benefits do you see in standardizing a policy. But these are the more popular ones. And I've just given you an example on how to go about selecting the policy for standardization. Um, now let's talk about processes. Uh, this one, um, of course, it's a topic on its own and we can spend a lot of time, but I'll try and cover some of the main aspects of process standardization today. When you start standardizing a process, let's say recruitment process or learning process, uh, it could be performance, you take your pick, succession, uh, exit management. Um, it's it's common, it's, it's, it's the common mistake that, uh, you know, HR practitioners make is, Again, we think too much about the efficiency and forget about the quality side of things, right? So we have to start with who are we solving for? Why are we standardizing a process in the first place? Of course, uh, to make it more efficient, quicker, cheaper, maybe, yes. But we also don't want the process to have an experience for our employees that is of lower quality, of 
lesser standard, right? Substandard uh, experience. Because if we do that, then at the end of the day, yes, we may have a quick process, but nobody likes it. Um, and, and that will, of course, have negative uh, consequences uh, for the organization, right? So persona mapping is a, is a very powerful tool. I think many of you may have seen this before. Essentially, it's about, and it comes from the field of marketing, where they are trying to understand their customer, their needs and wants, um, and then sort of try and build their products and services around that. So we borrowed that concept into HR. And this is an example of a persona uh, uh, canvas. It could be any other shape and form. The main thing is here, for example, uh, we can see the persona of a millennial. Uh, and, and, and we are trying to figure out, you know, what motivates them? Uh, what is the challenging part about their job? Who do they interact with in HR? What do they want from HR or the business? Uh, you know, or the organization. And once we have understood our customer, our employee, uh, then we go ahead and design a process uh, around that. So how do we do that? Step one, persona, obviously. But step two would be to sort of, uh, you know, look at the, look at the create a journey map, right? So essentially, uh, this is unconstrained thinking, as I like to call it. At this stage, you should not worry too much about do we have the data? Do we have the systems? Do we have all the things to kind of create this ideal journey? Uh, at this stage, it should be unconstrained. Uh, so you want to sort of draw out, ideally speaking, when you are hiring, when you're onboarding, when you are conducting performance appraisal, uh, or when you are asking people to go on there to create their learning plans, what is the journey you want them to go through, right? Who do you want them to meet? Uh, which systems do you want them to use? What should be the behavior of those systems? And, and, and those, those kind of things. So you create an experience that is high quality, right? And from that, we then go to the process maps, right? The actual act of process mapping itself, where you have swim lanes. Uh, if you're not familiar with process mapping, I, I would uh, urge you to sort of look at some of the BPMN notations. So you can see, you can find these resources online quite straightforward. Uh, but there's a way of sort of creating this. So you have swim lanes, which is essentially who's doing the job. And then you sort of go through the step-by-step -step you know, how, when does a process start? When does it end? Who's involved? What do they do? In this, when you come to this stage, now you want to start thinking about, uh, you know, the data, the systems, uh, and, and those sort of things, uh, because you can't have a process map uh, that you cannot, it should not have a process map that you cannot actualize or you cannot implement uh, next day, right? So, which is also why in many organizations, when it comes to process standardization, it goes along with, like I said earlier, uh, some kind of a technology upgrade, but it's not necessary. Uh, some organizations do process standardization in any case, right? Um, so that's how you sort of go. That's what I'd, I'd like to say on process standardization. Policy and process standardization, quite powerful tools if used in the right way. Um, I, I would say, you know, be careful about the ones that you select, uh, especially when it comes to policies and on processes, be mindful that the data and system side of things uh, have a part to play. Okay, so uh, Paganchi, I think you wanted to sort of share a little bit about uh, one of the process standardization uh, experiences at Data On. Uh, yes, uh, definitely, Pakshat. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, sebelumnya, terima kasih, Bapak Ibu uh, sekalian. Selamat siang, terima kasih atas kesempatannya juga kita bawakan webinar siang hari ini. Uh, mungkin menyambung apa yang uh, Pak Asya tadi sampaikan ya, saya mau review cepat saja karena berhubungan dengan apa yang ingin saya sampaikan. Ya, uh, tadi Pak Asya uh, berbicara mengenai uh, liver ada tiga liver ya, uh, beliau baru saja membahas liver pertama dan liver kedua. Liver pertama di mana kita perlu melakukan uh, measure and analyze ya, pengukuran dan analisa. Uh, benchmarking bandingkan uh, bandingkan HR operation kita dengan HR operation yang lain bandingkan HR operation kita dengan uh, best practice yang ada di luar sana ya yeah. uh, kemudian kedua uh, kita lakukan perlu dilakukannya proses standarisasi dan harmonisasi tadi perbedaan kedua itu juga sudah cukup jelas ya yeah. sangat perlu sekali dilakukan melihat perkembangan organisasi di mana organisasi yang semakin maju seperti yang kita tahu ya Bapak Ibu ya semakin banyak mengembangkan bisnisnya mungkin melalui merger atau akuisisi ya atau mungkin membangun bisnis baru anak perusahaan bisnis lain 
uh, bisnis unit dan lain sebagainya. Mungkin tidak hanya di Indonesia saja, tapi uh, berkembang di ranah global juga, di mana semakin banyak bisnis unit dari berbagai negara yang perlu dikelola oleh HR operation. Ya, bayangkan uh, betapa kompleksnya data yang perlu kita kelola di HR ada atau tidak ada sistem yang mendukungnya. Sebelum kita mulai proses uh, standarisasi, memang tools atau sistem tentunya mendukung sekali. Ya, tadi Pak Syed juga, juga sampaikan uh, sangat sulit sekali kalau memang tidak ada sistem karena kita perlu data yang akurat, data yang terjamin integritasnya supaya kita bisa melihat uh, pergerakan mau dibawa kemana. Uh, proses standarisasi dan harmonisasi kita ya jadi terlepas dulu dari ada atau tidaknya tidak adanya sistem proses standarisasi ini tadi dimulai dengan kita melihat uh, proses yang ada polisi atau peraturan perusahaan yang ada ya uh, saya ambil contoh tadi Pak Aksyat menyampaikan beberapa contoh uh, polisi atau peraturan perusahaan yang biasanya dilakukan standarisasi ya contohnya struktur organisasi Struktur organisasi bagaimana caranya kita membangun suatu diagram atau chart yang melibatkan seluruh bisnis unit yang ada. Tadi saya sampaikan bahwa organisasi berkembang merger, akuisisi, mungkin tidak hanya perusahaan di Indonesia, tapi perusahaan di luar negeri, negara-negara lain, Asia Tenggara, dan sebagainya. Bagaimana cara kita melibatkan seluruh bisnis unit yang ada dan mulai menggambarkan chart atau diagram tersebut. Ya, Kedua, kita lihat job grade atau golongan, golongan kerja. Ya, bayangkan skenario di mana setiap bisnis unit yang ada mempunyai daftar golongan yang berbeda. Saya rasa itu uh, uh, pusing sekali ya kita kalau ada bisnis unit yang kita perlu tangani, perlu kita kelola, ada golongan tersendiri, daftar posisi sendiri, mungkin lokasi kerja masih oke okay, karena bisnis entity beda entity, beda uh, work location atau lokasi kerja. Tapi kita bicara dari sisi job grade, struktur organisasi, dan masing-masing itu mempunyai dampak sendiri pada peraturan perusahaan. Bayangkan kalau kita bicara mengenai uh, manajemen cuti, manajemen cuti yang dibedakan antar golongan. Nah, kita baru saja bicara bisnis entity yang mempunyai golongan sendiri, ya. Atau kita bergerak ke payroll, di mana tunjangan dibayarkan berdasarkan golongan. Nah, mau berapa formula, mau berapa komponen yang kita perlu buatkan? untuk kita bisa lakukan standarisasi proses, misalnya satu payroll untuk beberapa entity, atau bahkan satu proses payroll dijalankan untuk semua bisnis unit yang ada bisa terproses dengan otomatis. Ya, Standarisasi kita jalankan untuk menyamakan polisi atau peraturan perusahaan, harmonisasi tadi Pak Syed juga beliau menyampaikan, kita jalankan untuk memberikan fleksibilitas ke masing-masing bisnis unit yang mempunyai peraturan negara yang berbeda dari sisi mungkin perpajakan, tax and statutory reporting, cuti izin sakit dan lain sebagainya. Ya, um, saya akan coba share screen saya. Pak Yasi, you want me to move the screen? Ah, I, I think you can uh, you can shut down screen. I'll, I'll share mine. Okay. Thank you. Nah, pada kesempatan ini saya ingin membawa satu case study ya di perusahaan kami sendiri datang di Indonesia ya mungkin saya akan singkat saja karena cukup banyak sekali proses standarisasi yang kita lakukan ya dalam dua tahun terakhir kita dihadapkan di kondisi dihadapkan dengan kondisi di mana pihak manajemen harus merasa perlu dilakukan proses standarisasi yang menyeluruh. Ya, kita lihat beberapa faktor yang mendorong satu adalah komposisi karyawan kita. Ya, saya juga agak kaget kalau Bapak Ibu lihat 64% adalah milenial atau Gen Y, 30% adalah Gen Z atau Gen Z. Ya, hanya 6% yang yang Gen X, baby boomers termasuk saya sendiri. Ya, makanya mungkin Bapak Ibu senang sekali dengan adanya webinar dan lain sebagainya, tapi seminar sendiri masih ada ketertarikan sendiri untuk untuk saya dan beberapa rekan yang ada di Datang. Jadi, kita perlu memahami komposisi daripada karyawan kita sendiri ya dan kita bisa lihat 94% staf kami adalah Gen Y dan uh, Gen Z ya. Di lain kesempatan saya juga pernah membawakan presentasi terkait talent management dan melalui proses uh, riset saya dapati salah satu fakta atau hasil statistik ya bahwa Gen Y dan Gen Z millennials ini dalam mencari pekerjaan 
tidak menjadi prioritas utama adalah gaji, bukan prioritas utama, namun fasilitas dari perusahaan yang bisa menunjang pergerakan karir mereka, ya karir planning, karir movement, fasilitas yang bisa memberikan kesempatan untuk belajar hal-hal yang baru, meningkatkan kompetensi mereka, skill dan lain sebagainya melalui e-learning, ya. Uh, kedua juga mereka adalah generasi yang uh, yang uh, istilahnya uh, melek teknologi ya uh, sangat tech savvy sekali dan suka sekali dengan hal yang dimudahkan dengan sarana teknologi ya jadi kita usahakan uh, semaksimum mungkin apapun fiturnya apapun fungsi yang ada di HR kita bisa lakukan proses yang namanya digitalisasi ya kemudian kita masuk dalam era new normal ya apakah masih relevan untuk memastikan karyawan masuk tepat waktu dan bekerja minimal 8 jam atau mungkin kita perlu mulai mengedepan, mengedepankan hasil daripada absensi ya kita mulai implementasikan hybrid working flexible work hours uh, mengembangkan benefit untuk mendukung uh, work life balance dan uh, kembali lagi ke demografi yang ada di perusahaan kami ya di era digital ini kami juga meningkatkan perlu meningkatkan uh, app engagement Ya, jadi akses yang baik, uh, mobility yang baik, dan dan terakhir selepas merger proses merger kami dengan grup uh, Humanica di di Thailand, bagaimana cara kami memastikan operation tetap berjalan dengan baik, ya security sistem dan lain sebagainya tetap terjaga, ya kepuasan tidak hanya klien kami tapi kepuasan bekerja karyawan juga tetap dipertahankan, ya. Nah, uh, saya masuk ke slide berikutnya. Tadi seperti yang disampaikan Pak uh, Pak Aksa, kita mulai proses ini tentunya melihat audiens kami, persona kami, ya, yaitu customer kami, yaitu karyawan kami sendiri. Ya, tadi sudah saya sampaikan terdiri dari millennials, uh, uh, Gen Z, Gen Y, uh, regional culture juga berpengaruh karena kami ada uh, kantor di beberapa negara di uh, Asia Tenggara, ya, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Filipina, Singapura. Nah, ad- yang ketiga adalah Education background. Kenapa saya pilih education background? Saya ambil contoh spesifik seperti Bapak Ibu ketahui datang Indonesia bergerak di bidang uh, piranti lunak ya software house ya uh, agak surprising buat 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 kami ya bagaimana bisnis yang sama ketika kita menjengal humanika hanya berbeda negara saja kita melihat majority majority atau mayoritas staff consultant staff consultant memiliki background pendidikan atau S1 yang berbeda. Ya, di, di perusahaan kami, sebagian besar staff consultant kami mungkin dari uh, background teknik komputer, uh, komputer science, ya, mungkin akuntansi, kom- komputerisasi akuntansi, dan lain sebagainya. Namun di beberapa negara di luar sana, terutama, terutama Thailand, kita melihat bahwa mayoritas justru background-nya adalah finance accounting. Ya, nggak ada hubungannya sama sekali dengan sistem, walaupun kami adalah uh, software house. Nah, kita perlu mengidentifikasikan, kita perlu mengerti demografi yang ada di perusahaan kami tersendiri dulu sebelum kita lakukan proses standarisasi atau uh, harmonisasi ya jadi tadi salah satu slide dari Pak Aksyat juga sampaikan janganlah kita membuat segala sesuatunya tanpa terlebih dahulu mengidentifikasi persona perusahaan kita ya justru kita melihat dulu kita mengerti dulu uh, demografi yang ada baru kita sesuaikan dengan proses-proses yang baru, polisi-polisi atau peraturan perusahaan yang lebih standarisasi, nah baru kita bergerak ke arah sana. Jadi jadi jangan dibalik ya, Bapak Ibu ya. Nah saya lanjut dulu. Nah ini adalah hal-hal yang kita ingin capai ya. Jadi sejak kita lakukan merger dengan Jumanika, kita lihat new normal at work. Ini beberapa key inisiatif yang kita ingin lakukan. Ya, dan tentunya saya nggak akan bahas semuanya karena akan uh, panjang sekali. Ya, salah satunya diantaranya adalah implementasi uh, OKR. Kita akan bahas itu sebentar nanti. Ya, kemudian dari sisi rekrutmen, uh, reduce applicant processing time by uh, 60%. Ya, bagaimana tools tools dan uh, sistem bisa membantu semua ini? Ya, terutama yaitu inisiatif berikutnya memberikan user experience yang yang lebih baik. Ya, jadi apapun yang diperlukan ada aksesnya, ada toolsnya, ada sistemnya. Ya, seperti juga training kami 
kami juga sudah melakukan proses-proses seperti e-learning ya di mana materi training sudah bisa diunduh, sudah tersedia secara online. Setiap training yang kita lakukan kita kita record, kita rekam ya sebagai referensi sebagai library kita ya, kemudian continuous learning dan lain sebagainya. Nah, mungkin diagram berikutnya akan sedikit membingungkan, cuma saya ingin sampaikan sedikit ya. Uh, kalau kotak biru yang Bapak Ibu lihat di bawah itu adalah platform uh, HR kami yang terbaru ya Sunfish Workplace ya. Dulu kita sebutnya Sunfish sekarang dengan adanya merger flagship kita adalah Workplace HR ya. Uh, Bapak Ibu lihat bisa lihat bahwa seluruh fungsi HR yang ada mulai dari HR Core ya. HR Core berarti uh, pengelolaan data karyawan, payroll, absensi dan lain sebagainya ditangani oleh sistem ya. OKR performance management ditangani oleh sistem ya. Tadi saya sampaikan sekali lagi OKR bukanlah hal yang baru ya. Model OKR itu dalam performance management bukanlah hal yang baru. Namun OKR yang dibantu oleh sistem itu masih menjadi uh, tren saat ini, sesuatu tren yang baru saat ini yang uh, uh, sedang diimplementasikan ya. Kita bergerak ke modul training, recruitment semuanya dilakukan melalui satu platform yaitu workplace HR. Ya, tentunya kita ada postur yang lain. Kalau Bapak Ibu lihat di kota-kota warna putih di atas, kita ada manajemen kafeteria, kita ada manajemen transport. Misalnya, konsultan kami mau ke klien, mengunjungi, mengunjungi klien, ada event, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, semua ini dibantu dengan tools, dibantu dengan sistem, tidak hanya mungkin tidak hanya desktop base, ya, namun dengan mobile app-nya juga. Ya, itulah yang maksud dimaksud dengan. Application engagement ya dengan kita melihat demografi perusahaan kami 94 persen totally Gen Y Gen Z semuanya tech savvy semuanya melek teknologi semua yang mereka bisa lakukan bisa dilakukan melalui mobile app itu yang salah satu target standarisasi kita jadi bahkan ke depannya nanti kita lakukan self review OKR check in e learning semuanya bisa dilakukan melalui mobile app ya. Uh, saya akan sampaikan mungkin beberapa. Jadi uh, pertama adalah uh, OKR. Ya, dua key initiative yang menurut saya uh, yang yang termasuk major. Yang pertama tadi mobile HR tadi sudah saya sampaikan. Jadi uh, tracking uh, work from home, work from anywhere itu sudah bisa kita akomodir. Ya, time tracking, fleksibilitas, uh, flexible hours dan sebagainya. Semua aktivitas karyawan bisa dilakukan melalui mobile app, ya, tanpa harus ke HRD dan lain sebagainya. Makanya, untuk seperti uh, Gen X atau Baby Boomer seperti saya, saya sangat, sangat menanti-nantikan acara-acara seperti company outing karena kita bisa bertatap muka, ya, atau seminar kita bisa bertatap muka. Namun, di era digital ini, ya, tentunya kita perlu mengakomodir kebutuhan-kebutuhan yang ada melalui mobile app tadi, ya. Oke, okay. uh, sebelum kita lanjutkan lagi dengan liver yang ketiga oleh Pak Asyad, ya, saya ingin sampaikan mungkin uh, beberapa hal. Yaitu bagaimana cara kita standarisasi OKR. Ya, sebelum kita masuk ke OKR, sebelum kita memakai model OKR dulu, kita masih menggunakan model performance management berdasarkan KPI objektif ya which is yang memang sebenarnya masih kita lakukan melalui OKR ini namun lebih termonitor ya terlebih terkelola. Jadi kalau Bapak Ibu lihat di sini dari data Indonesia sendiri ada objektif K yang ingin dicapai ya dan objektif itu bisa nggak kita alignkan oleh beberapa departemen yang ada di perusahaan kami. Ya, jadi tidak setelah kalau kita mau high, high growth, misalnya kita, kita mau mencapai revenue sekian, itu tanggung jawabnya tidak hanya di manajemen, ya, namun kita turunkan, kita align, kita lakukan alignment ke masing-masing departemen, mulai dari departemen sales and marketing, kemudian dari uh, 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 departemen development piranti lunak, bahkan uh, kemudian departemen implementasi dan lain sebagainya, dan kita bisa melihat. Dan kita bisa melihat bahwa setiap departemen, setiap depth head, setiap section mempunyai andil dalam mencapai target-target perusahaan di akhir tahun. Ya, dan kita melakukan monitoring itu on a monthly basis dari Januari sampai Desember, ya, supaya kita bisa memonitor mana 
key result yang tercapai, mana key result yang belum tercapai, perlu kita lakukan revisi atau tidak. Ya, Jadi ada semacam diagramnya juga seperti suatu organisasi, tapi kita melihat dari sudut pandang OKR atau objektif yang ingin dicapai. Ya, nah mungkin sekian dulu dari saya. Nanti saya akan lanjut lagi di uh, akhir materi kita. Ya, sebelumnya kita saya lanjutkan, saya uh, berikan kembali akses ke Pak Akset. Akset, go ahead. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thanks, Pak Anche. Let me share my screen again. And let's continue. Uh, that that was a, I think a great example you shared there on um, uh, process harmonization at data on as we went about uh, this merger recently. Uh, I hope you can see my screen properly. Uh, we'll talk about lever three, which is continuous improvement. Right. So let's continue our conversation. That third thing we can do in order to be more cost efficient. Um, as you can understand, um, when you talk about process as uh, cost efficiency, um, you know you can't. You should not um, think of it as a one-time activity, right? So we may, for example, we're trying to make one of our processes or all of our processes quicker, faster. Maybe we go ahead and implement, uh, you know, we uh, an HR system. So maybe we implement Sunfish or Workplace, and we say, okay, that will obviously give us some benefits. Uh, uh, but you have to HR has to, in fact, every function has to continuously identify more and more things that we can do in order to sort of uh, improve, right? Um, so one time is not enough. Um, now the trouble most HR organizations now I know you know conceptually most people will philosophically most people will agree with me and they'll say yeah continuous improvement is important, but many organizations are not able to do it, um, especially HR organizations and there is a good reason for that. Um, in many cases, uh, HR departments are already, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's so much to do, the workload and those kind of things. HR is becoming one of the most critical functions uh, in creating differentiation for your employees and, and the competition out there. Many a times, HR just does not have the time, right, uh, to pause and reflect and think and measure and say, okay, how do I improve this a little bit more? It's a capacity issue. Um, in some cases, <clears throat> there is it may not be so much on capacity, but maybe you don't have the right kind of tools or expertise within your HR function, right? Uh, as, as, a, as a team, as an HR team, you may be pretty good at just running the business uh, as usual, can be a you kind of a thing, uh, but improving it, taking it to the next level, maybe those, cap those skills are missing, uh, or maybe you don't have the right tools and the data uh, to begin with, right? You, like I said, you can't fix what you can't even measure, right? So maybe you don't have the right kind of software infrastructure, you don't have the right data, those kind of things. So there could be issues uh, around that that prevent us from uh, continuously improving our HR function. <clears throat> However, if you do not have those kind of issues, today I'm going to share with you a few ideas on how you can go about doing it, right? So here, uh, Humanica Consulting uh, this has come up with a I think one of a kind offering, actually, I do not think it exists in the market at the moment where uh, we're offering continuous improvements as a service, essentially. Um, so what we do here is we come in and we do a, a, a bit of a baseline. Uh, we assess where your organization is, HR organization is, qualitatively, quantitatively, the context of it, context is important, just numbers are not the whole story. Um, and once we have done all of that, uh, there, are, there are tools that we use around benchmarking, maturity assessment. Uh, there, there's a plethora of tools. Um, then we sort of create a roadmap. Here's the things we can do quarter by quarter. And then we don't go away, right? So we, we make those, like I said, interventions are everything, recommendations. What are you going to do, right? Um, so once we have that, then we can work together. There are multiple models possible. But basically, every quarter, Humanica Consulting, our team will come down uh, have a look, have a review, look at what has been achieved in that quarter uh, and what do we do for the next quarter, right? So uh, I think it's a pretty innovative offering. What I have for you today is a few samples from that. I know we are also running short on time because this Q&A, a &A, lot of good questions coming through. I want to give it the right amount of time as well. But I just wanted to show you uh, what this is. Uh, so maybe uh, you can take some ideas from this and start doing this in your own organizations. Like I said, if you have the data, tools, expertise, skills, there's no reason you can't do this. Um, so maybe it can inspire some ideas in you, right? 
but my suggestion for most hr practitioners don't try and do everything on your own uh, because you know no one person uh, knows everything um, so sometimes it's just good to have someone around um, but the other thing around continuous improvement is uh, you know being aware of what's going on in the market so it's extremely important when you think of continuous improvement to look at the latest leading practices in the market so with those things i think i'll just go into um, you know what this uh, offering is all about uh, we call it workforce intelligence and coaching <clears throat> and we believe that it's it's we call it intelligence right uh, you would have heard uh, analytics uh, as, as standard reports uh, have been around for ages now i think uh, we all know uh, here you can see an example so a standard hr report will basically tell you how many people you hired how many got promoted how many resignations in a given time period um, so that's a standard hr report an analytical insight, the next level of that could be some kind of a dashboard that gives you some insights, right? It tells you, for example, that, hey, 46% of the people who left in the last two years were at a certain job grade. Now, that's an analytical insight. Now, you, you, you can investigate further, okay, at this particular grade, something's going on. The attrition levels are very, very high. What is the reason? Um, another example there, like 67% um, of movements were between a certain grade. Uh, between two certain grades. These are just examples from, uh, you know, uh, the, in your organization, your grades might look different and those kind of things. But where in workforce intelligence and coaching is different from all of this, uh, if you have a good, by the way, if you have a good software, if your data is clean, you should have these uh, reports and dashboards available to you already. I think later, Pakyanjim might show us a few dashboards from workplace. But if you have a good tool like that, uh, then you already should have all of this. What is needed beyond that is the so what, right? So what do we do then, right? If, the, if these are the, this is what the report is telling us. If this is the insight we now have, we'll need to dig deeper. We'll need to investigate. We'll need to look at the underlying data. We may need to do a few focus groups and interviews and figure out what exactly is going on and what do we do? And that's what this intelligence and coaching layer on top of uh, you know, intel just uh, standard analytics um, and insights is, is what we're offering, right? So it's something that we offer, but it's there's no reason why you can't do it yourself. I'm going to just very quickly show you a few examples and then hand over to Park Yanche as well, because uh, he wants, I think we should look at a few uh, dashboards and reports available in work workplace if time allows. Um, the, the process is quite straightforward. You start with data collection. Forget the weeks here because it depends really on case-to-case -case basis, but you start with data collection uh, where you identify the, build your first hypothesis, what's going on. Uh, your initial findings come along. At this stage, we sit down with the clients uh, and we identify the priority areas. So we've done some fact finding. We know there's a few things going on. And then we say, okay, which ones are the priority? And then we create like a, plan right quarter by quarter so every quarter we sit down again uh, those interventions those initiatives that we have identified maybe your organization if we just give you like a, a prescription on hey, okay here's what needs to be done maybe you can go do it yourself in certain cases you might say listen we need your help uh, to do it and in those cases we can help you do that as well but in most cases we believe hr team can be enabled if we are able to provide them uh, the right kind of intelligence and insights at the right time uh, then they can go ahead and do those things on their own. Um, and then finally, there's a coaching aspect to this because what we also want is our HR uh, colleagues to uh, uplift their skills, their capabilities as they work together with us. Uh, and so we're always there to sort of coach and guide the HR organization as and when required, right? So some uh, interesting uh, insights that we draw on, <clears throat> for example, something we call talent flow. Right. This is one analysis I think everyone should do in their each in their organizations for their organizations. Uh, how many people are you hiring? How many are being promoted? Uh, you know, how many are essentially no change, stuck in their roles, not going up, not going down? And how many are exiting? Who are they? Uh, you know, what uh, demographic are they from? This is an analysis that is so simple uh, that but it's often ignored. It also tells you the shape of your organization, right? I'm not going to go into that in too much details today, uh, but your organization, is it looking like a, a, a pyramid? Does it look like a flying saucer? Does it look like an inverted pyramid? Why is that the case? Is it accidental? Is it by design? Is it a good thing or not? Does it even matter? Maybe it doesn't. 
those kind of questions need to be analyzed. So very simple analysis that you can do yourself um, and, and sort of, it will already start to give you some insights on what's going on, right? Especially if you have good data for the last, I will say three years, at least three years, if more than even better, um, you should be, uh, do this analysis and trust me, you will walk away with some interesting insights that you did not have earlier, right? Uh, you can look at, of course, a departmental view uh, on, on where you are gaining the FTEs and where you are losing the FTEs. Um, so that tells you a little bit about the attrition. Same deal, you can look at it from a, a purely from an age bracket perspective, right? How many millennials versus Gen X versus Gen Z and boomers in terms of joiners and leavers? And then what does that do to the shape of your organization? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Do you see certain grades where people are kind of stuck, you know, in many organizations, especially this happens at the mid management levels, right? You get promoted, but at a certain level, you sort of get stuck because you cannot be promoted anymore. And organizations end up looking a little bit like what I call flying saucer. But again, uh, these kind of things are quite interesting, pretty simple analysis, which you can do if you had the tools and the data, right? The other thing we do is looking at performance, right? So we definitely want to retain high performance. I think every, all of us would agree we want to retain the high performers uh, and we want to do some action maybe on those who are not performing well. Um, so that's another uh, you know analysis we do, which is this you can see here, this one is a heat map. Again, these visualizations can change. There's no fixed rule, but we have a few templates that we start with. Um, if, if you prefer, we can always do a different kind of visualization. But here, for example, we're looking in this particular organization, 44% of the talent that went out in the year 2022 uh, was average uh, or outstanding, right, in the last year. So that is concerning. If you have something like that, uh, that's concerning. So we had 94 resignations in this particular organization, right? So whether it's a grade view, like where are these people mostly? Are they concentrated in a certain grade and they're leaving? These things also become important and that those are dotted um, boxes you see there. Another thing which I think is quite unique, I call it, uh, we call it performance personas. Uh, we, we saw the concept of persona a little bit earlier. And what we do is we apply that to performance management as well, right? So it's quite common for us to sort of have a standard performance management framework. We do a calibration. But have you ever thought like, why are certain people, um, you know, high performers and what is the commonality uh, in those people, right? So this is what we do with, you know, you see three examples here. Uh, one persona type can be rising stars. So these are people, for example, who are going up uh, in terms of their performance year on year basis. They are only improving and these are rising stars. So we try and analyze this particular cohort. We put them together. We look at the various demographic aspects of these people. We try and identify commonalities and the reasons as to why rising stars are rising stars because that can help us help others who are not rising stars, right? So once we understand what works for them, we can perhaps train others, coach others, uh, motivate others to be like them. Uh, there could be some, for example, what we call frozen in time, right? They don't go up, they don't go down, they don't go laterally, they're just stuck in that one role. Maybe it's been seven years, eight years, 10 years, who knows? Um, the question is, is that okay? Because, you know, it, it, it could be for a legitimate reason. And if the individual is happy with that, that's fine. But can we do something to stimulate this individual? That's another persona. Another one could be fallen angels, for example, we call it. These are just names that we have, tags that we have, uh, you know, kept. You could call it something else. Uh, but the point is that, you know, if they are high performers or used to be high performers, and now we start to see uh, them sort of their performance levels go down over years, maybe they're average now or just doing the bare minimum. What's wrong? Uh, do we see some commonality in these kind of individuals as well? If so, is something wrong fundamentally at a process policy level or a culture uh, level that we need to change in order to bring these people up? The whole idea is to support people in being the best version of themselves themselves, um, and, and sort of therefore uplifting the productivity of the entire organization. Another thing that we do is we look at pay for performance, right? So we'd like to think that we, we reward people uh, in the most justified manner and high performers always get, uh, you know, the maximum amount of benefits in terms of compensation and bonuses. Uh, but actually in the world of HR is can, can be a bit funny because when you start and those who are involved in compensation and benefits would agree with me, when you start doing the mathematics and you get into the details, it's very easy to lose track of what's going on. And in many organizations, uh, you know, are high performers, you would be surprised, 
on a percentage basis are not paid more uh, than average performers. That ends up happening, right? It's not, it's not because people HR does not want to reward high performers. These things are complicated when you look at the base salary, the, the grades and the comp structures and those kind of things, these things can happen. Um, and of course, that can lead to resentment in the employees. So it's good to do some kind of an analysis. This analysis gives you the outliers, for example. We also look at it from persona view, uh, but the, you can see the band and you can see those yellow dots on either sides. Those are the ones outside range and they are being underpaid or overpaid relative to their peers for the same performance level, right? So there's something that we need to do about that. Um, and the most important thing is not just this analysis, but what are we going to do about it, right? So like I said, as a part of this uh, workforce intelligence and coaching package, we also provide recommendations and we come in every quarter um, and, and we, we see you know, if there are, have, has been any progress on those recommendations along the quarter, if the HR, uh, you know, our HR colleagues, they want to call us, they want a coaching session because maybe they're confused on how to go about fixing a few things, we do that too. So that in a nutshell is the workforce intelligence uh, and coaching service that we are offering. Um, I think uh, the, the most important thing here is that you need to have some level of HR systems, data and tools available, right? So if you have something like Sunfish or Workplace, you are ready already, uh, you know, then, then some, something can be done about it. But if you don't have anything, if you're running a paper-based organization or a manual, largely manual HR organization, then it could be done, uh, but it's going to be a little more difficult, obviously, uh, because the you know digital the digit the data is maybe lying uh, all over the place. Um, so some prerequisites required for this, uh, but we believe it's a pretty innovative solution in the HR world. Uh, however, if you believe that you know you, you you hopefully you've been inspired, if you saw some ideas and you thought thought these are great and you want to go ahead and do it yourself, please be my guest. Uh, I think this would be a, a good analysis for your organization too. Uh, Pakanchi, you wanted to show a little bit uh, on the workplace uh, reporting and analytics capabilities, uh, right? Uh, yes, sure, uh, uh, Pakshat. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'll share my screen. Okay, uh, Bapak Ibu, kita lanjut sedikit lagi, ya. Yeah. Uh, mungkin yang saya ingin uh, tekankan beberapa slide yang tadi Pak, Pak Aksyat baru sampaikan menyambung apa yang beliau sampaikan terkait uh, tuas atau liver uh, ketiga tentang continuous improvement. ya Setelah kita lakukan proses benchmarking, identifikasi masalah-masalah yang ada, uh, bagaimana kita lakukan intervention baik short term maupun long term untuk mengatasi masalah-masalah tersebut. Kemudian tadi kita bahas mengenai tuas atau liver kedua terkait proses standarisasi dan dan harmonisasi ya dan kita diingatkan kembali oleh beliau bahwa proses atau cycle ini perlu dilakukan berulang kali makanya disebutnya continuous improvement ya monitoring terhadap data hasil daripada program-program program yang sedang dilaksanakan mempersiapkan diri kita mempersiapkan uh, HR ya atau mungkin manajemen untuk intervensi-intervensi ke depan ya karena zaman bergerak terus ya era digitalisasi bergerak terus selalu ada hal yang baru tiap hari ya bagaimana kita mengadopsi bagaimana kita mengakomodir uh, semua kebutuhan yang ada dengan teknologi-teknologi baru dengan tools-tools yang baru ya itulah sebabnya tadi uh, disampaikan Pak Syed, beberapa organisasi uh, meresponi kebutuhan ini membentuk tim PMO change management dan Analytics, ya, yaitu yang yang ingin saya sampaikan beberapa contoh. Ya, saya ingin te tekankan di slide ini uh, workflows intelligence dan and coaching ya, terutama kalau Bapak Ibu lihat di bagian di bawah tadi uh, beliau mengatakan standar HR report ya, hires promotion versus exit uh, bulan ini ada uh, new hire nol ya, 50 promotion, 90 resignation. Ini informasi yang mungkin cukup jelas tapi tidak terlalu membantu. Ya, ya Bapak Ibu ya mungkin ini hanya berupa laporan saja tapi ini bukan 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 analytics. Kita nggak tahu eh, yang promosi itu dari background mana, berapa line of service-nya, dari golongan mana, dari departemen mana, yang baru bergabung atau sudah lama bekerja. Ya, yang resignation, resignation karena apa? Resignation karena eh, dari masa berlaku yang paling lama atau masa bekerja uh, paling sebentar dari golongan mana ya dari departemen mana nah informasi-informasi tersebut tentunya berguna sekali ya uh, seperti tadi uh, kata Pak Syed, 
dibutuhkan tools atau paling tidak HR system ya namun kalau memang tidak ada pun tidak ada masalah ya beberapa services yang disampaikan yang diberikan oleh uh, tim Pak Arsyad bisa memberikan hal-hal intelijensi seperti ini ya analitik seperti ini uh, saya akan sampaikan beberapa mungkin uh, menghemat waktu ini adalah beberapa analitik yang kita ada di dalam uh, sistem workplace ya kita sebutnya dashboard ya dashboard ini mengambil data langsung dari database jadi semakin banyak datanya, semakin akurat datanya, semakin tinggi integritas data yang ada, semakin banyak fitur atau modul yang dipakai, semakin berguna juga hal-hal uh, dashboard ini untuk memberikan hasil-hasil uh, analisa, guna untuk memberikan rekomendasi-rekomendasi strategis ya dalam mendukung uh, jalannya perusahaannya, ta target atau objektif dari perusahaan. Ya kita ambil contoh. Ini adalah dashboard uh, employee, ya kita dari sisi gender, dari sisi uh, headcount, turnover, ya uh, mungkin lebih enak saya coba masuk langsung ke dalam sistem, ya ini slide hanya beberapa saja, ya uh, saya ambil contoh ini adalah uh, overall gender ya male and female, uh, ini adalah headcount, ya kita seringkali lihat headcount mungkin berdasarkan uh, departemen center atau headcount berdasarkan lokasi kerja. Tapi coba Bapak-Ibu bayangkan kalau kita ada datanya, tentunya kita ada datanya, kita bandingkan headcount berdasarkan departemen, namun juga dengan dari umur, dari gender, ataupun dari background pendidikan misalnya. Jadi kita bisa tahu uh, background pendidikan mana yang yang mengcover headcount kita, ter, uh, headcount perusahaan terbanyak di departemen mana. Nah informasi tersebut tentunya jauh lebih berguna daripada kalau kita menyampaikan headcount kita ada 1000 karyawan ya 500 uh, pria laki-laki 500 perempuan nggak terlalu bermanfaat untuk kita ya nah saya ambil lagi beberapa contoh yang ini dulu ah nah ini adalah masa kerja masa kerja jadi kita bisa melihat komposisi demografi karyawan kita lebih banyak di masa kerja sudah berapa lama dan lain sebagainya ya turnover tidak kita tidak hanya lihat turnover dari sisi departemen tapi turnover paling tinggi terjadi di bulan-bulan berapa dalam satu uh, tahun berjalan ya biasanya kita bisa melihat misalnya saya ambil contoh aja uh, kebanyakan karyawan mencari uh, peluang baru opportunity baru di akhir tahun misalnya atau mungkin sebelum sebelum lebaran kemarin mulai mencari opportunity baru sehingga setelah lebaran ada di tempat yang baru dan sebagainya hal-hal seperti ini yang bisa menjadi uh, acuan juga ya ini tadi saya sudah sampaikan juga background pendidikan jadi dari total karyawan 1.000 3.000 karyawan kita uh, berasal dari background mana saja ya atau kita bicara soal rekrutmen kita berhasil merekrut kebanyakan dari institusi atau universitas mana yang terbesar yang memberikan kontribusi yang paling banyak dalam uh, aplikan atau kandidat yang ada. Ya, jadi hal, hal seperti ini dan ini tidak terbatas tadi saya sampaikan bahwa semakin data uh, lengkap, akurat, uh, uh, terintegrasi juga dengan sistem integritasnya tinggi, banyak hal banyak sekali hal yang bisa kita tampilkan di sini. Ini mungkin ter terkesan agak agak biasa ya, tapi saya ingin tunjukkan satu hal yang menurut saya mungkin agak uh, cukup Menarik ya, ini adalah salah satu analitik kita yaitu resignation prediktif. Bagaimana kita memprediksikan siapa karyawan yang akan resign? Ya, menurut saya ini cukup menarik. Ya, rumusnya apa? Nah, ini mungkin nanti di lain kesempatan ini kita akan bahas. Ya, banyak sekali parameter yang kita masukkan di sini. Uh, saya ambil contohnya saja. Ini attrition rate-nya 56% dapat dari mana? Formulanya seperti apa? Peng parameter apa saja yang berpengaruh dari gajinya, dari uh, absentismnya, dari FTI-nya, dari umurnya, dari uh, uh, misalnya length of service-nya, dan kita bandingkan tentunya dengan parameter-parameter seperti dia dari golongan mana, dari uh, departemen atau de uh, divisi mana, ya dan lain sebagainya kita juga bisa tentu bisa melihat bahwa top 5 uh, divisi di mana karyawan likely untuk resign ya uh, turnover dan lain sebagainya ya saya tadi bicara sedikit mengenai uh, saya tadi bicara sedikit mengenai OKR ya uh, dashboard atau analytics ini sangat berguna sekali kita melihat di pertengahan tahun kita sudah ada di bulan Mei ya sebentar lagi Juni 
mana objektif yang sudah tercapai, mana key result yang sudah tercapai, mana key result yang belum ada hasilnya. Apakah kita perlu revisi, apakah kita perlu adjust lagi, atau kita perlu lakukan uh, alignment yang, yang, yang baik supaya masing-masing departemen atau masing-masing PIC yang terlibat dalam proses uh, uh, OKR ini uh, bisa mencapai target-target mereka masing-masing. Ya, kita lihat progres per departemen, departemen mana yang uh, dari sisi key result sudah men, sudah uh, mencapai, sudah tercapai beberapa key resultnya. Ya, key result mana yang progresnya paling minim? Ya, uh, key result atau objek mana yang sudah mulai, mana yang belum selesai, mana yang on track? Ya, mana yang uh, mungkin pencapaiannya di bawah rata-rata atau di bawah target bulanan misalnya. Nah, hal-hal seperti ini tentunya bermanfaat. Kita masih cukup banyak dashboard lain lagi, ya time attendance kita bisa melihat uh, siapa yang uh, absen, siapa yang lembur, lembur paling banyak di departemen mana, ya lembur paling banyak dari golongan mana uh, dan dan seterusnya. Ya sekali lagi ini tidak kami batasi uh, berdasarkan data yang ada kita tentunya bisa berkreasi juga ya informasi mana yang bisa dianal memberikan analisis yang baik kepada pihak uh, manajemen untuk mengatur strategi-strategi yang ada. Ya, jadi uh, ini adalah beberapa contohnya ya terkait uh, tadi juga Pak Syed menyampaikan seperti data movement uh, bagaimana strategi meningkatkan retensi, produktivitas dan kualitas. Ya, yang terakhir mungkin saya ingin sampaikan hal-hal seperti performance uh, performance management Ya, di mana ada KPI, ada kompetensi yang saya ingin sampaikan adalah kita tidak berhenti hanya pada saat uh, selesai scoring, yaitu berdasarkan skor kita mau kasih bonus salary increment berapa, namun ada hal-hal yang sifatnya analitik juga yang bisa kita uh, lihatkan. Ya, da, pertama, bagaimana si Katrina ini dibandingkan dengan performer yang lain? Ya, kedua di departemen Katrina dia uh, uh, bagaimana scoring scoring yang diberikan oleh si reviewer depan dep head ataupun supervisor, ya apakah membentuk suatu kurva yang lebih optimal atau tidak? Ya, jadi kita bisa melihat bahwa uh, dep head ini sebenarnya uh, sangat murah hati sekali dalam memberikan penilaian, ya atau mungkin perlu sedikit lebih uh, uh, optimum membentuk suatu kurva normal dalam memberikan penilaian harus lebih objektif misalnya. Nah, yang terakhir tadi. Pak saya juga sempat menyampaikan bagaimana kita mengidentifikasikan potensial-potensial yang ada. Ini sangat relevan sekali dan sangat standar sekali kami implementasikan di mana kita bandingkan antara antara performance, score performance kinerja karyawan dengan kompetensi. Ya, mana yang start employee, mana yang need development. Kita seringkali melihat karyawan yang performance-nya sangat baik, kontribusinya sangat besar, team player etika kerjanya sangat baik dan sebenarnya cuma kompetensinya kurang, skillnya kurang. Berarti apa yang bisa kita lakukan? Kita berikan training. Ya, ada juga karyawan yang skillnya sangat baik, kompetensinya sangat baik, namun dari sisi performance kurang. Misalnya attitude-nya kurang, sering bekerja sendiri, tidak tim player. Nah, apa yang bisa kita lakukan? Kita bisa lakukan coaching, kita bisa lakukan counseling. Nah, hal-hal seperti ini, analitik seperti ini yang memberikan kita hasil analisa kemana kita ingin bergerak. Ya, apa yang perlu dilakukan untuk melakukan employee retention? Ya, dan masih banyak lagi uh, hasil dari 4,69 ini. Artinya, apa mau kita lakukan? Follow up reaksinya apa? Ada training plan dilihat dari gap analisis kompetensinya, perlu training apa? Kemudian, uh, perlu ada project spesifik atau ada project uh, development plan yang dikhususkan untuk karyawan tersebut, untuk supaya kinerja ke tahun depan lebih baik. Apakah karyawan ini sudah siap kita promosikan? Ya, kalau sudah siap dipromosikan, apakah sudah ada suksesornya? Nah, hal-hal seperti ini kita uh, mau coba uh, kembangkan, ya. Jadi tidak bergerak dari hal-hal yang sifatnya administratif, mendorong HR supaya bisa memberikan kontribusi strategis juga ke perusahaan. Ya, pada akhirnya tetap tujuan kita adalah bagaimana meningkatkan retensi karyawan, produktivitas dan kualitas karyawan yang bekerja di perusahaan kita. Ya. Uh, terima kasih Bapak Ibu. Mungkin saya akhiri presentasi saya di uh, slide ini. Uh, Siela, silakan. Baik, terima kasih.
Terima kasih. Thank you, uh, Mr. Akshat and Pak Anche for your presentations. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop your questions drop to Ken Ebon. I will help deliver your question to our speakers. Sebelum kita lanjut ke sesi selanjutnya, saya kembali mengingatkan untuk rekan-rekan mengisi feedback form karena sekaligus untuk mendapatkan e-certificate. Silakan scan QR yang tertera atau klik link pada kolom chat yang sudah saya kirimkan. Mungkin akan saya beri waktu untuk rekan-rekan scan QR yang tertera di screen rekan-rekan. Uh, Oke, okay, uh, stay tune sampai akhir sesi karena masih ada kuis uh, kahut yang menanti rekan-rekan semua. Let's move to Q&A session. We already uh, a few questions. I will try to deliver to our speakers. Uh, the first question is uh, for uh, uh, Mr. Akshat. How much influence does HR have on the company in reducing costs, considering that there are still many companies that are not too concerned with the HR functions within the company? Thank you. Yeah, uh, what a great question. Uh, I think HR can play uh, a, a, a very, very critical role uh, when it comes to things like cost reduction and, and reducing the overall operational costs of the business. Uh, that said, I think if you're talking about the overall cost of the business, not just the cost of the HR function, <clears throat> HR cannot do it alone. So you will have to partner with the uh, operations team. You will have to partner with the technology team. You will have to partner with the finance team. Uh, but what HR can do is help coordinate all of that, right? Because the way you structure your organization, the way you structure the jobs, uh, the way you allocate work within your organization, um, and the pace at which you are able to hire or, or put the right people in the right place with the right skills, all of that obviously will increase business value, right? And no other department is able to do that. So yes, uh, there might be organizations that still don't think of HR um, as, a, as a primary contributor uh, to these things, but I think uh, that's where it is uh, upon us as HR practitioners to educate our uh, uh, business leaders and, and show them with data, uh, you know, with analysis on how HR can contribute. So the answer, short answer is, it can play a critical role in cost reduction actually. Thank you, Mr. Akshat, for your questions. Uh, I have a question for Pak Yance uh, from Pak Nanang. Uh, the first is, what can maximize employee value with the latest telemanagement solutions? And can I can I access it hassle-free anytime and anywhere? Okay, uh, thank you, Sheila. Saya menjawab uh, mungkin dalam bahasa Indonesia juga. Terima kasih, Pak Nanang, ya. Uh, talent management solution tadi juga saya sempat uh, uh, tam, sampe, sampaikan atau tampilkan beberapa hal ya. Jadi dalam meretensi karyawan kita juga mau karyawan yang bekerja di perusahaan kita juga kita potensinya kita kenali, kita identifikasikan, potensinya kita kembangkan ya. Jadi kita mau juga seluruh karyawan yang ada di perusahaan juga bisa uh, bergerak dalam karir plannya dia. Jadi ada beberapa komponen tadi yang saya sampaikan pertama adalah dari sisi training plan-nya. Ya, dari sisi training plan kita harus mengidentifikasi dari sisi skill atau kompetensi apa yang kurang. Ya, ini terkaitan berkaitan juga dengan uh, training library kita ya, baik itu e-learning atau training pada umumnya, sudahkah kita memetakan masing-masing training yang kita berikan dengan kompetensi atau skill yang ada. Ya, kita nggak mau memberikan training yang istilahnya just for the sake of doing training, tapi kita juga mau training itu bermanfaat. Uh, uh, training itu sasarannya jelas ya kompetensi atau skill mana yang kita kembangkan ya tentunya ada feedback dan evaluasi juga yang kedua tadi juga ada development plan individual development plan ya kita lihat dari performance scoring mereka uh, sebenarnya yang perlu dikembangkan apa ya kenapa target tidak tercapai ya kenapa objektif tidak tercapai ada kelemahan kelemahankah yang perlu kita uh, tingkatkan tapi tidak bisa ditingkatkan melalui training Nah, kita mungkin coachingan counseling dari saya sampaikan. Mungkin ada aktivitas atau uh, assignment spesifik untuk karyawan tersebut ya, atau beberapa perusahaan mungkin uh, mengirimkan beberapa kandidatnya untuk sekolah lagi misalnya sekolah malam dan lain sebagainya. Tentunya ada ikatan dinas kerja juga ya. Dan dan yang terakhir adalah tentunya tadi saya sampaikan ada nggak luang untuk karyawan untuk naik dari sisi karir plan-nya dia. 
ya apakah career plan bergerak ke atas dalam departemen atau atau uh, istilahnya divisi yang sama atau malah cross divisi atau cross departemen ya sometimes kita melihat ada banyak sekali karyawan yang mungkin stuck atau di posisi atau di departemennya karena itu bukan passionnya dia itu bukan di mana dia bisa excel ya mungkin yang tentunya di engineering pindah drastis ke finance menurut saya itu fine fine saja dan kita berikan kesempatan untuk karyawan tersebut untuk mencoba atau mungkin ada sarana sarana yang kita berikan seperti training untuk meningkatkan kompetensi atau skill tertentu tertentu ya dan yang terakhir adalah ketika kita promosikan karyawan tertentu kita jangan istilahnya selalu terlebih dahulu mencari kandidat untuk mereplace dia dari luar ya ada nggak yang dari dalam yang bisa kita naikkan jadi suksesornya siapa ya parameternya cukup banyak formulanya cukup banyak juga tergantung masing-masing polisi yang ada peraturan perusahaan yang ada ya dilihat dari line of service nya dilihat dari uh, cara dia bekerja penilaian kerja kinerja selama beberapa tahun terakhir Uh, pernah ada uh, disciplinary action atau tidak itu juga menjadi salah satu faktor juga. Nah hal-hal inilah yang 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 menurut saya tools-tools yang ada untuk meningkatkan yang tadi saya sampaikan retention, productivity dan kualitas. Ya mungkin itu bisa menjawab uh, pertanyaan kedua tadi bisa diakses dari mana saja. Kalau kita bicara terutama sistem kami Sunfish atau Sunfish Workplace sudah ada mobilnya ya jadi apa yang bapak ibu bisa akses melalui web based sistem kami bisa juga diakses melalui mobile app ya itulah mungkin untuk gen y gen z lebih terakomodir ya cuma buat saya lebih enak melihat layar yang besar <laughs> ya mungkin sekian dari saya sil silakan baik terima kasih pak yance untuk uh, penjelasannya oke okay, next questions i have a question from uh, mr akshat how much for hr benchmarking salary or cost and uh, from uh, bu widya widyawati is there any downside of benchmarking thank you okay great questions um, i'll tackle the first one it's uh, pretty straightforward so uh, benchmarking when you say how much i i'm, I'm assuming you you want to know how much does it cost to do benchmarking if that's the question it it's not all that expensive it really depends on uh, the level of details you want to go into um, so uh, the most basic level of benchmarking starts at a very very uh, reasonable uh, fee i would say um, you could actually go ahead and benchmark yourselves if you want to purchase a benchmarking database but if you're not an expert in benchmarking i would recommend against that uh because like benchmarking can be tricky um and and making those adjustments uh digging deeper finding that context is important right so otherwise it can be perceived in the wrong way uh but if you get a consultant you could you could call humanica consulting will be happy to talk to you uh and given your needs uh you know figure out uh, a cost that would work out for you so it's not all that expensive if you're talking about like a baseline benchmarking but of course if you're talking about a uh, uh, a lot of details many many entities many many countries uh then it can get a little bit the cost can add up but we can have a conversation on that uh, it's not all that expensive if you ask me um <clears throat> to the second question any drawbacks to benchmarking um a very interesting question and um i was uh, thinking about this as well so if you remember what i said during the benchmarking section um was you know be careful on a couple of things right i said compare apple to app apples to apples uh uh you know uh, make sure that you have adjusted uh, for your unique context uh make sure you are comparing yourselves against an organization that is relatively similar to yours finding an exact match can be quite difficult and finally uh you know make sure that when the results are presented uh to management to leadership to anybody um it is presented along with the context not just the numbers because just the numbers is not the complete story so is there a drawback to benchmarking if those things are not done uh the the results of a benchmarking exercise can be uh you know misconstrued can be misunderstood right uh, if you remember that case study i i shared with you uh hr team size looks you know in their case it looked like they had a lot of people in 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 their hr department right so if someone just came in and did a benchmarking did not adjust it uh did not take into account all those things that we found out then obviously the result would have been and it would be a wrong result 
the 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 result would have been hey you have too many people and you should fire some people from your hr team which was not going to help them because they were growing and and so drawbacks are uh, i think often these things are ignored and then the results are misunderstood and wrong decisions are made so yeah but if done well you can do a very good job at identifying uh, you know what's wrong and how to go about fixing it okay so i'm going to stop there many good questions coming in actually i'm, I'm quite uh, Happy with the quality of questions. Thank you, Ms. Ashad. Next question uh, for uh, Pak Yance from Bapak Abdul. Apakah semua fungsi HR harus distandarisasikan? Apakah semua fungsi HR bisa distandarisasikan? Mohon informasi lebih lanjut mengenai workplace HR. Mungkin untuk yang informasi lebih lanjut mengenai workplace HR, mungkin nanti Bapak Abdul bisa langsung menghubungi sales masing-masing uh, atau bisa langsung email kami di info at data on, nanti akan kami follow up uh, lebih lanjut. Terima kasih. Silakan Pak Yance untuk menjawab pertanyaannya. Ya, yeah, uh, thank you, Sheila. Mungkin ini pertanyaan lebih cocok Pak Aksel yang jawab, tapi saya coba bantu dulu. Ya, uh, saya mengutip dari apa yang Pak Aksel barusan uh, sampaikan juga. Ya, semua bisa diharmonisasi, namun tidak semua bisa distandarisasi. Ya, jadi kita ketika kita uh, uh, istilahnya bergerak di perusahaan yang mempunyai multiple entity, tidak hanya bisnis unit yang ada di lokal Indonesia, namun bisnis unit atau entity yang ada di luar negeri juga, di Asia Tenggara ataupun negara yang lainnya. Kita perlu sedikit fleksibel dalam melakukan proses standarisasi. Ya, Hal-hal yang bisa distandarisasi tentunya kita akan lakukan, tadi saya sudah sampaikan beberapa hal, Pak Aksa tadi juga ada slide yang cukup banyak daftar item-item apa saja yang biasanya dilakukan standarisasi. Ya, mungkin dari sisi uh, golongan, struktur organisasi, manajemen cuti, uh, peror, dan lain sebagainya, itu menurut saya perlu distandarisasi. Ya, bayangkan kita lakukan uh, man manajemen cuti yang berbeda antara satu bisnis entity dengan bisnis entity yang lain. Itu uh, pusing sekali dari sisi HR-nya juga. Ya, saya juga pernah ketemu ada satu uh, klien kami yang manajemen cutinya peraturannya berbeda antara karyawan yang bergabung sejak tahun 2005 dengan polisi perusahaan, polisi cuti dengan untuk karyawan yang bergabung sebelum tahun 2005. Ada hubungannya dengan proses merger atau akuisisi perusahaan, namun itu memberikan suatu beban menurut saya kepada HR, apalagi nanti ada change management-nya, bagaimana kita bisa istilahnya melanjutkan polisi-polisi tersebut, ya kalau memang tidak kita standarisasi. ya. Nah, hal-hal yang tidak bisa distandarisasi, kita bergerak ke harmonisasi, hal-hal yang paling simple seperti payroll misalnya. Ada hal-hal yang bisa kita standarisasi seperti tunjangan makan, tunjangan transport, mungkin itu bisa kita standarisasi across bisnis unit yang ada. Ya, namun tidak terlepas dari peraturan negara, dirjen pajak masing-masing negara itu mempunyai polisi yang berbeda, ya, statutory report atau contribution yang berbeda, itu kita harus fleksibel. Nah, itu yang tadi Pak Aksyat sampaikan mengenai uh, harmonisasi, ya, localization yang kita lakukan juga untuk bisnis unit yang berbeda negara atau berbeda nature atau kulturnya ya mungkin di sini kita ada uh, uh, cuti uh, yang yang diberikan oleh uh, depnaker seperti cuti uh, ada keluarga yang meninggal ada keluarga yang menikah nah cuti-cuti seperti ini mungkin tidak ada di Thailand atau di Malaysia atau mungkin di Singapura ya kita ada cuti misalnya izin uh, cuti naik haji misalnya di negara lain belum tentu ada nah ini yang disebut dengan salah satu contohnya ya proses harmonisasi, ada yang bisa kita standarisasi, tapi untuk hal-hal ini kita fleksibel, sesuaikan dengan kultur, sesuaikan dengan persona bisnis unit tersebut, dan kita uh, lakukan proses harmonisasi. Semoga bisa menjawab ya. Nah, tamut, namun nanti slide-nya kalau kita berikan ke Bapak-Ibu, Bapak-Ibu ada satu slide khusus yang Pak Aksyat sampaikan, hal-hal apa saja yang biasanya distandarisasi di masing-masing perusahaan. Menurut saya slide itu sangat berguna sekali. Ya, terima kasih. Yes, terima kasih Pak Yance. Mungkin uh, saya mau mengingatkan juga kepada rekan-rekan uh, nanti untuk PowerPoint-nya akan kami share setelah webinar mungkin 3 sampai 4 hari kerja. Terima kasih. Oke, okay, Mr. Asyad, uh, the next question is for you from uh, Budian Siska Sembiring. Hi Mr. Asyad. Sorry. Hi Mr. Asyad. Wait, wait, wait. Wait. Okay. 
uh, while we're waiting, uh, let me just pick another question I got here. Uh, this one is around, uh, you know, me talking about, and we'll, we'll come back to that question also, Sheila. Uh, this one is around HR spending time on non-core HR activities. Uh, this organization uh, apparently has that problem as well. Um, and where HR is doing things like, you know, religious events or whatever, but it's considered very important by the management and the owners, right? So what does HR do? Uh, so that's the reality of life. I think that's a great question. I wanted to pick this one. Um, <clears throat> the first step in um, solving this, so to speak, uh, because if it's, if it's important, it's important, right? I'm not say, gonna say that, uh, because especially in Asia, uh, some of these things lead to uh, engagement and, and eventually productivity or the feeling of, uh, you know, uh, teamwork and all that stuff, right? So it can lead to collaboration and all. So it's important. I'm not going to say it's not important. <clears throat> there are two approaches to this. One is where you create a sort of a segregation within your HR function, one that deals with general administration and the other that deals with core HR activities, right? So you can solve it through org design. And so HR department has two sub departments, then one purely focused on general administration that can include all these activities and the other one that focuses purely on core HR. Another way to approach this is, uh, you know, if you don't want to deal with that is to do the, the kind of study that, that, that we saw, uh, you know, in this particular case where you really uh, track where you are spending your time right now. And then very respectfully, you need to present that back to the management saying, here's where all our time is being spent right now. Do you think this is the best or the most optimal way of us spending our time or should we spend it in another manner? So sometimes uh, having that respectful conversation starts with uh, objective analysis. Um, so those are the two strategies I would suggest. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you stop doing those things if they are considered important by the management. Uh, that would not be a good thing because someone still has to do it. Okay, thank you, Akshat. Uh, Mr. Akshat, sorry. Uh, maybe that's the last questions for our today's webinar. Mungkin untuk uh, hadiran semuanya. Untuk pertanyaan yang belum jawab, mohon maaf. Tapi nanti akan kami kirimkan jawabannya kepada email di thank you email. Mungkin di tiga satu tiga sampai empat hari kerja. Baik, uh, thank you for a question to our speakers. Hopefully our speakers can answer all your questions. Sebelum kita lanjut ke sesi terakhir yaitu sesi kuis, saya kembali mengingatkan nih untuk rekan-rekan mengisi feedback form karena sekaligus untuk mendapatkan e-certificate. Nah, rekan-rekan bisa langsung scan pada PR yang tertera atau bisa klik link pada kolom chat yang sudah kami kirimkan. Mungkin akan saya beri waktu untuk rekan-rekan scan PR yang tertera. Silakan yang belum bisa langsung uh, scan QR. Oke, okay, uh, sesi terakhir akan kita mulai. Untuk rekan-rekan mungkin uh, setelah ini akan saya share screen untuk bisa masuk ke Kahoot dan memasukkan pin yang sudah yang akan kami share pada uh, setelah ini. Saya akan share screen. Sebentar, mohon maaf. Oke, okay. untuk rekan-rekan bisa langsung memasukkan pin yang tertera pada layar yang sudah saya share. Untuk pinnya ada di 5124235. Bisa langsung join, akan saya tunggu kurang lebih satu menit. Untuk teman-teman, untuk rekan-rekan bisa langsung join. Kita ada lima pemenang nanti. Uh, untuk pemenangnya akan saya hubungi setelah webinar dan setelah saya validasi di feedback form. Jadi kalau rekan-rekan belum, uh, setelah saya cek ternyata belum mengisi feedback form, mohon maaf akan kami geser ke uh, pemenang setelahnya. Silakan join rekan-rekan. Nanti PowerPoint akan kami kirimkan juga beserta pertanyaan yang belum uh, sempat kami jawab. Gitu. Baik, masih ada waktu rekan-rekan? Ayo silakan uh, uh, saya bantu bacakan. Untuk game pinnya ada di 5124235. Baik, sebentar lagi akan saya mulai.
Masih ada lagi? Oke, akan saya start sekarang ya, rekan-rekan. Untuk rekan-rekan yang memperhatikan uh, presentasi tadi, pasti bisa menjawabnya dengan mudah. Oke, okay, ada lima pertanyaan. Pertanyaan pertama, what is the formula for HR cost efficiency? Uh, untuk games ini dimenangkan oleh pertanyaan yang cepat dan yang uh, tepat. begitu. Oke, okay, next. Kita lihat scoreboardnya. Pertama dipimpin oleh Bapak Syarif, kedua Ibu Farah, ketiga Ibu Adit, Bapak Aditya, sorry. Yang keempat Bapak atau Ibu Silmi, dan yang terakhir ada Ibu Rahmule. Oke, okay, saya next. Pertanyaan kedua, betul atau salah? Three, lever, three levers for cost efficiency are measure and analyze standardized operations and continuous improvement. Betul atau tidak nih, rekan-rekan? Waduh, yang betul menjawab 37 orang. Kita lihat. Oke, Bu Farah memimpin. Kita lanjut saja langsung. Pertanyaan ketiga, true or false lagi. Betul atau salah? Baik, 35 orang yang menjawab benar. Kita lihat yang memimpin. Oke, Pak Andreas, kita lanjut lagi. Pertanyaannya. Masih bisa kekejar nih rekan-rekan. Ayo kita cepat-cepatan. Baik. Masih dipimpin oleh Pak Andreas. Kita lanjutkan. Oke, pertanyaan terakhir nih. Wah, cepat banget nih jawabnya nih. Udah paham banget pastinya. Baik. Kita lihat pemenang ketiga oleh Ibu atau Bapak Aul. Selamat. Yang kedua oleh Ibu Dian Siska. Selamat. Yang pertama, Bapak AG, Bapak AG mungkin bisa di chat ke saya untuk nama, eh, jangan nama singkatan karena nanti akan saya cek di feedback form. Selamat kepada pemenang. Oke. Oke, okay, selamat untuk para pemenang. Nanti pemenang akan uh, kami cek terlebih dahulu validasinya. Lalu akan kami hubungi setelah webinar berlangsung. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya rekan-rekan semua. And thank you so much also to Mr. Akshat and Pak Yance for the very, in very interesting and insightful presentations. Hopefully it can be useful for, for all our attended this webinar. Uh, sebelumnya, before I end this uh, Webinar, maybe uh, Mr. Arshad and Pak Yancek uh, can on apa uh, on screen uh, on cam. We are gonna take uh, some uh, screenshot for our documentation. Okay, in one, two, three. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Akshat and Pak Yance. Dan tentu saja rekan-rekan yang sudah melawankan waktunya untuk mengikuti webinar hari ini. Terima kasih sekali. Nah, jika rekan-rekan ingin bertanya lebih lanjut atau ingin request sesi demo nih lebih 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 detail lagi mengenai Sunfish Workplace, bisa langsung menghubungi tim sales masing-masing atau bisa hubungi kami di email yaitu di info@datown.com atau kunjungi website kami di www.datown.com. www.datown.com. Jangan lupa untuk follow sosial media kami untuk mengikuti update tentang info-info menarik. Kita ada di LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, dan Facebook. Saya Siala Denya, pamit undur diri, selamat sore, dan sampai jumpa di Data Talk berikutnya. Bye all, stay safe, stay healthy.